We're going to be uh, picking up the passage there. And uh, First Timothy has been a wonderful book for us, as uh, Michael's just mentioned. We're going to take this and next week in two sections. We're going to look at chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 this week, and verses 14 through 16 next week. And, and because of that, I'm going to read that section uh, in, in its fullness, verses 11 through 16 now, although we'll only do verses 11 through 13 this morning. Let me read from God's holy and errant and inspired word. These things command and teach. Let no man despise your youth, but be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so you shall both save yourself and them that hear you. May the word of God land on the good soil of our hearts and produce fruit for his glory this day. Well, so far in this chapter, Paul has been instructing Timothy regarding his approach to ministry. Now, let us not be um, misplaced in our understanding of what ministry is. Ministry is simply, in biblical terms, service to God. We're all called to ministry. We're all called to serve God. Amen. Now, you may look at me and say, well, Pastor Wayne, you know, you have a particular role in the church. Yes, I do, but I have a particular ministry, but we all do. We're all gifted by God, as Timothy's about to find out. Paul's reminding him, you must steward those gifts. You must work out your salvation. You must be an example to the other believers. Now, this is true of Timothy individually, but it's true of all of us. That we all must be faithful to that which God has given to us. So, we can look at the beginning of the chapter in your Bible. You can do this with me now. Uh, he's already gone through the importance of the context that Timothy was to uh, be working in. In verse 1, he's warned of addressing false teachers. He should know truth from error. In verse 2, he's to live in good conscience, giving thanks to God for everything because God is the giver of all good things to us. Then to be received with gladness. In verse 3, Timothy is to sanctify and separate his life to the Word of God and to prayer and these ordinary means of graces that he's to uh, use uh, and understand thoroughly and saturate his life in. Uh, in verse 6, he is told to nourish himself uh, and then faithfully teach himself out of what he's learned of God's Word, reminding the church that they're all to be servants of the Lord, including himself. In verse 7, he is told to not just recognize, but refuse and reject doctrinal error, vain teachings. Uh, Paul calls them uh, empty uh, teachings, uh, myths, fables. And then in verse 7 and 8, he's told to do this in a manner of an athletic training in a gymnasium so that he may run to win. He's doing this deliberately, intentionally, and with a, a focus that is becoming that uh, in verses 7 and finally 8, he's doing this for a reward, not just in this life, but the, the life to come. He's doing this for the eternal weight of glory that he is wanting to please his Lord, receive that crown and then take that crown and then lay it down at the Lord's feet, giving him all the praise and the glory. Well, this is ministry background for Timothy, but now Paul is going to speak into Timothy's life individually. And he's going to speak to him personally. Uh, Timothy is a spiritual son and he has a spiritual father. And what I want you to see most importantly in this passage is the uh, mode or the ethic or the practice of discipleship in the local church. 
Paul would not know to say these things to Timothy if he didn't know about Timothy uniquely and personally, personally and intimately. He knows about his health. Drink a little wine for your stomach. He knows about his uh, fear of ministry, your timidity. Here he's addressing his youth. Don't be worried about what people say about your age. It's how you live that matters. Let the church see how you live. Let your profiting appear to all. They won't be so worried about your age anymore, Timothy. Now, this wouldn't happen if Timothy as a pastor was being shepherded by a spiritual father and Timothy was then to exude these things down into how he shepherded and loved the people. And so there's this whole idea that Timothy is known by Paul, the church is known by Paul, and therefore the care and concern is coming out in this letter. As God's appointed leader, Timothy needs to be encouraged, as we all need to be encouraged by those above us. This is what church life looks like. Like We can't do this in isolation. We can't do this through YouTube or through Zoom. We must do this life on life. And this is why the gathering of the church, the fellowshiping of the saints, is so important in the ministry and the life of the local church. Amen? Amen. You know, church is the gathered body. It's the called out ones who gather together to love and encourage one another in the faith. And I don't believe Ephesus should be any different from Parahills West. <laughs> we should know one another. We should love one another. We should know our needs and care for that. Just like we've received an offering to give to brothers in India, <clears throat> it extends us. It helps us to think outside of ourselves. And this is what body ministry is like. The fact that somebody would say, look, I can watch the sermon later online, completely defeats the purpose of the gathered church. To come together. Well, I could, I could read that in a book on my own. You're missing what church is about. It's about gathering together <clears throat> to encourage one another, to build one another up in the faith. So let's have a look at our outline. If you're taking notes, we're going to look at the areas that Paul's addressing to Timothy. Now, there are seven areas that we'll do over the next two weeks. So I'm going to give them all to you now. So you can almost be pre-reading for the next week and come with maybe questions that might be answered in the sermon or that we can cover on Wednesdays. Number one, uh, Timothy's perceived authority in the church. That's verse 11. Timothy's perceived authority in the church, verse 11. Number two, Timothy's perceived age as an elder in the church. Verse 12. Number three, his, that is Timothy, his perceived example as a minister of the gospel. Verse 12. Number four, which is where we'll get to this week, his perceived understanding of his role as a teacher. Verse 13. His perceived understanding of his role as a teacher. And you put part two here. Next week we'll look at his perceived importance of spiritual giftings in ministry. I'll say that again. His perceived importance of spiritual giftings in ministry. Number six, his perceived notion of how his growth affects others in the church. The pastor affects their people. Very important principle to look at next week. It's verse 15. And finally, point seven, his perceived recognition how he as a minister plays a role in the salvation of his congregation. I'll say that again. His perceived recognition of how he as a minister plays a role in the salvation of his congregation. Now, the main point of all of this, to get the big picture, again, you're welcome to write this down. I'll say it a couple of times. 
The main point here is that all believers need someone who knows them well enough or who know them well enough to point out their issues and help them to be a godly example. So by being transparent and accountable, we are able to help another brother or sister, help them with their challenges, the issues that they face, the things that we work through as Christians, so that in working through our profiting may appear to all and we can be great examples for one another and thus an encouragement in the faith. So let's get started. We've got some ground to cover here, verses 11 through 13. Let's start at verse 11. These things, Timothy, you are to command and to teach. Well, Timothy was God's man, the ordained teacher for the church at Ephesus. And while Paul was not with him, Paul reminds him that, Timothy, you are to command in your teaching style. As if it was Paul theoretically instructing himself. This is an apostolic Command that the church is hearing being read to them through this letter, and that Timothy is to command like Paul commanded. Now he's to command and teach these things, verse 11 says. Well, whenever Paul says these things, he's referring to the things that he's already mentioned. You could look at chapter 3, verse 13 of 1 Timothy. Oh, sorry, 3, verse 14. And chapter 4, verse 6. He says these things, whenever he says these things, it infers what's already been taught and it's a reminder to not forget what I've taught you and I'm going on to a new section. And this is what he's doing here. I've taught you how important it is to minister in the life of the church, to address error, to be training like an athlete, to be working towards godliness. But now, remembering these things, I now want to talk to you about your personal walk and areas where you need, where I know, Paul says, you need help. And isn't it amazing, think about this for a minute, because I don't think we often think about it this way, that this letter is being read to the church and Paul's telling them about Timothy. So it's a little bit exposing for Timothy, isn't it? Timothy, don't let the church look down on you or despise you because you're young. Now there's a two-fold emphasis that's going on here. Paul's wanting to let the rest of the church know how they should be looking out for Timothy. Later on, he's going to say other things like, look, if you're a preacher of God's word, you're worthy of double honor. I mean, they're uncomfortable things for a pastor to hear. Normally, a pastor wants to go, well, look, you know, let me just serve and just do a good job. Don't be worried about these other things. You know, what I should be getting or how you should be honoring me. So this is all very transparent. This is being read to the church at Ephesus. Okay, so particularly in chapter 6, you can see there in chapter 4, no, verse 6 of chapter 4, is to remember the words of faith and good doctrine. So verse 11 is what I kind of am revolving around here that Tim's, uh, Timothy's ultimately to be remembering and not forgetting these things because they're all based around the words of faith and good doctrine. So he's, these things he's to command and to teach. The word command is a compound word. It's two words together. Para and galos. Para comes from, maybe you can remember the word for paraclete. The Holy Spirit will be your helper. He will be alongside you. A para, along next. That's what that means. Uh, and and galos, you can hear the word angel there. That's where we get our word angel from, which means a messenger. An angel is a divine messenger from God. So Timothy is to command. He's to get alongside someone and know them well enough that you can say God's word to them. This is what it is to command with authority. It has that sense that it's fully authorised and come from somebody else through a necessary channel. Now when you read your Bible and an angel shows up, they're not showing up of their own accord. They're showing up because God sent them to deliver a message and they don't deliver it in their own authority. And that's where this word has come from. Timothy... You are to teach and command. And this doesn't come from you alone. You're teaching God's word. This comes from God. This is God speaking. Don't be worried about your youthfulness or your timidity or your shyness. 
When you have God's word and you're preaching it and teaching it, you need to get into command mode here. And you need to know that now God's addressing his church when the word of God is being preached. In other words, Timothy, don't weaken your commitment to teaching, particularly what you know to be God's faithful and true word to his people, despite what has happened with false teachers or false brethren. Paul's exhortation to remind Timothy to command during his teaching opportunities in the church is a solemn reminder that when Timothy teaches, he is teaching from God's word. You know, I don't teach this morning suggesting to you that it might be a good idea. I've got to say to you, this is God's word. It is the idea. Anything less is disobedience to God himself. And so as a pastor, it's not like you're authoritarian, but you've got to teach with the authority that comes with God's word. Why? Because God's word has the ability, and only God's word has the ability, to change, to transform, and to work within your heart to bring about the change God requires. He's telling Timothy, as you teach, teach with God's word, he's not simply giving him, you're not giving Timothy an opinion to the church. Now he saw himself as young, not being heard by those that only in the church. This is what was called age veneration in the ancient world. Age was revered. The older you were, the, the, the more and culturally we know in Asian cultures, elderly people uh, that they're looked up to. And maybe in our culture, in Western culture, that's not as good as it could be. But we admit, having said that, uh, there was certainly that age, uh, that age veneration going on in the ancient world. And so Timothy was being reminded not to be so focused on how his age was being perceived by others when he was teaching. That wasn't the primary issue. No matter what his age, the important thing was to remember, when you speak God's word, you're speaking in God's stead. And so don't shy back from that. That's got to be done in an authoritative manner. That's why when we're teaching from the scripture, we don't take on this conversational time. Unless we're maybe kind of bringing out something where we need to go that way. It's always in an authoritative way that we're teaching God's word. Now, turn with me. Let's have a look at how important this is. Uh, keep your finger in First Timothy. But First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I'll build a case here for this. Paul says to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Well, what are they thanking God for? Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, so there's the two modes. Men of God who preach God's word, what are they thankful for? That you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God or the word from God. Now this is important as hearers in church today. That you hear what I'm saying, not as the word of men. Not as the word of the pastor only. This is the word of God that's being taught here. I need to give it its due respect. I need to, despite what I think of the pastor, whether I think he's young, whether I like what he's wearing, whether I like the tone that he's delivering it in, it's got to be done and recognised that this is God's word that's being taught. Whether, whether it's through a vessel that I necessarily kind of am grappling with, that it's God's word that's being taught. You welcome it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God, which also, also works effectively in you who believe. Now turn to John chapter 12, and we'll look at that in a moment. But as you do, this is like exactly what amazed people about the Lord's teaching style. The Lord taught in a way that was completely different from the Pharisaical pros of the day, so to speak. He taught as one having authority, one that was commanding in a way that it wasn't just him in his own right doing it. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees taught in their own authority, didn't they? This is what we teach. This is how you keep us happy. And Jesus taught completely differently. And actually it said that the common people heard him gladly. Uh, we'll get to John 12 in a minute, verse 49. But in Matthew 7, 28 29, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd were astonished, saying, He taught as one who had authority, not as the scribes. So even Jesus, like Timothy, in some ways, not always exactly the same, but while being the incarnate Son, spoke not from himself, but in the authority given him. 
This is the mode of all gospel preachers. They don't speak on their own behalf. They speak as one being sent, an ambassador, on on behalf. Jesus spoke and used the Father's authority. And here we see in John 12, 49, he says, For I have not spoken from myself, but the Father who sent me has himself given me commandment that what I should say and that what I should speak. So Timothy is really mimicking the model of our Lord in that I speak only what the Father tells me to speak. I'm just preaching God's word to you and this must be done with authority. But John MacArthur says that this type of preaching, the excellent minister's preaching is to to be authoritative. Done in a command mode, he says. Such preaching, preaching imitates God himself. Of whom Paul wrote in Acts 17.30, God is now declaring to all men everywhere that believe that they should to, to believe and repent. Jesus commanded his hearers to repent and believe. As John the Baptist did as well. The Father commanded all to hear his Son and to obey. Every call to believe the gospel is a command to repent. Every call to saints to obey the word of God is a command to submit to the authority of God and not run with your own. To Titus, Paul wrote, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. So no matter how Timothy or Titus was feeling, he was to, when in teaching mode, to command in a way that people knew that this was God's word to them. And that word had life-changing power in it. Now why does this have to be done so forcefully? I think John Flavel, one of the early English Puritans, wrote this. The minister's labour in the word is not like any other normal labourer, Flavel says. It is not with us preachers as with other labourers, he says. They find their work as they leave it. So a normal labourer, they leave their tools, down tools, they go home, they come back, and it's exactly the way it was. They pick up work from where they left off the day before. Well, he says, as with other labourers, they're going to find it as they leave it, but not so us. Sin and Satan, Flavel says, unravel almost all that we do. The impressions we make on our people's souls in one sermon seem to vanish before the next. So our labour, when we have God's people with us, when we're preaching God's word, when they're sitting under God's word, when each one of us are, is so critical. One author points out that all the pastoral duties, the preaching, the teaching of all of them, that teaching and preaching of God's word is by far the highest calling to the man of God. How tragic it is then to see so many in our day that have diverted from that. They spend their time on non-essentials and their people end up spiritually impoverished. Great John Stott says of John Huxtable, quoting John Huxtable, it says that a man does not qualify to be a preacher of the word simply by making sallies. That's an old school word for one liners, little gimmicky lines, into the good book to discover some peg on which to hang some scattered observations or observations about men and affairs. It's not how to preach God's word. Huxtable is saying this is not how we command God's people to live. Godly in Christ Jesus. So Timothy's to command and to teach. Let's go to verse 12. Let no man despise your youth, but be an example of believers in word and conversation, in spirit, uh, in charity, in spirit, in faith and purity. I must say that some of your versions won't say spirit there. That is a King James thing in the original text. Spirit isn't there either. And so I would just take those five things and say that's the spirit in which he's to grow in and uh, to be an example in. Paul refers to Timothy as young here. I guess this begs the question, well, how old is Timothy? 
although it's now been some 15 years since they first met on the Apostles' second missionary journey, Timothy was probably in his early 20s at that time. And although he's now in his mid to late 30s, most commentators believe, so mid to late 30s, he's still 30 years the junior of the aged apostle. And by the standards of Greek culture, Timothy is still a young man. Alright, he's still not really deemed to be somebody that would bring the wisdom of the age to the table. Now, the age issue was one that was obviously getting to Timothy. Uh, we're going to look at other verses about how many commentators believe that Timothy was at the edge. If you look at chapter 1, verse 3, Paul's telling Timothy, don't leave Ephesus. What do you think Paul's concerned about? Timothy might just be on the edge of packing up his bags and going. Now, this is the temptation in ministry all the time when things don't work out our way. And quite frankly, they normally don't work out our way. And Paul's saying to Timothy, you've got to stick with it. No matter how hard it's getting, no matter how, false, how many false teachers you've got to rebuke, no matter how many unruly brethren you've got in the church, you cannot leave your post, Timothy. If God has called you to this and he's given you gifts for this, you must remain at Ephesus. And now he's telling you, don't let people get to you because they think you're too young. Literally, the word despised here doesn't mean hating him. I'll tell you what it literally means. It means being scorned or insulted by literally disregarding everything you're saying. So you know how, this is how Timothy was basically being mocked in Ephesus. The elderly people, you know, they might stay for the worship and then as soon as Timothy got up, they might walk out the door. Or they might just sit there with their arms crossed and just literally look everything about their body language like, I'm not interested. You're not old enough. You've got to impress me. It's similar to, I know I'm a vocational trainer and I do that to sort of bring in some income. And I know when I go to a workplace and train, I, I might still, you might have a person that's been working in their workplace for 30 years. And I might get there and they might be thinking, well, what could you possibly teach me? It's that type of thinking that's going on here. It's that prideful, arrogant, uh, who are you, you young little whippersnapper, to tell me what to do? Well, that's certainly not the attitude of a learner or a disciple. Now, Timothy tells, uh, Paul tells Timothy that he's to be an example. And I want you to catch this because I think this is very important. The Greek word there comes from typos which means a prototype. And it denotes a mark that is made by striking. I've made an impression because of what I've just struck into the mould. I've made a prototype. There's, a, there's an imprint now and I can pour myself into that and it will become like what I need it to be. We think example is just live one particular way and through osmosis or some other means, we're going to have an impact. You know, like old Francis of Assisi was quoted of saying, you know, um, well, preach the gospel if necessary, use words. I think we need to speak into somebody's life if we're going to begin to mould them. Um, a lot of people don't even believe he quoted that. So this is to make an impression by striking something in turn as a mould to shape something else. The word picture, it paints is that Timothy is to be a prototype or an example that others not can only emulate, but then he is literally uh, moulded and pressed into their lives. So if I could put it this way, uh, say with Brother Michael, I'm investing so much into his life that I'm moulding him and shaping him so that he's thinking differently and responding differently is what Timothy's called to do. Not to live a particular way only, and he's to do that, but he's to have an involvement in one's, another person's life so that it's a moulding, shaping. So this is what it is to disciple, isn't it? To speak into somebody's life, to be open. I think, think of the most vivid pastoral moments I've had. It's not when I think I've been looking good for somebody else to see. It's when I've been sitting over the table with coffee at someone. I was sitting down in my home in my study and they're pouring out their hearts to me and me helping them or giving them 
perspective or input or whatever that looks like or challenging them about well, why you're doing that and here are some ways that, to work around that. These, are, this is what it is to be an example. To speak into somebody's life, to work with someone to mould and shape the way that they live in future. A prototype. When you've got a prototype, what are you doing with that prototype? That is the set example that you're going to use and everything else is going to come out almost mirror image. And so Timothy's told, and feel the weight of this, Timothy, you ought to pastor in a way that you're just not preaching a sermon on a Sunday, you ought to have a shaping influence after you command and teach. The Word of God will do its work, but you must get alongside the people. And and this is why he's going to go on in chapter 5, the next chapter, and say, here's how you've got to work with the ladies. Treat them as sisters. Make sure that people don't come up to you and just rebuke you randomly. Alright, they shouldn't be rebuking somebody like that. So there's all these ways that we begin to work with people after this particular passage. It's very interesting, isn't it? How we're to work together as a family, show respect for one another, treat elderly women like mothers. Timothy, treat the young girls like sisters. So yeah, there's all these implications here. By far pointing to discipleship that's active, not followership, which is passive. There, I think, is the big difference. And we'll do more of that on Wednesday when we get to our Bible study. We'll talk about the difference between active discipleship, having that influencing, moulding, shaping, speaking into one another's lives. This is what we do with one another, isn't it? Praying for one another, encouraging one another, rebuking one another. All of these things that go to your brother and tell them about, that is a moulding type of influence as opposed to, well, I'm living a good life and hopefully that's going to rub off on someone. That is not biblical discipleship. And Timothy is well known by Paul. The church is well known by Paul. And Timothy is to know the rest of his congregation in that way. It's a big standard to follow even as a pastor. So as Timothy's been an example, he's given a five-fold area where he should be having this pressing influence, this shaping influence on the congregation. Let's look at it. Number one. Here's to be an example in word, that is logos, speech. Now, if a minister's going to get himself in trouble, it's normally with his mouth, because he does a lot of talking. (laughs) So you've got to be careful. Your mouth is a blessing because you can preach God's word, but you can also say some silly stuff too, can't you? You can be very careful there. Uh, Wrong speech can undo us very quickly. Hughes and Chapel say this in their commentary. Some of us just plain talk too much. Most modern day pastors being viewed, uh, being viewed as a, like a spiritualized Jay Leno with a clerical collar, endeavoring to use their words to entertain and to entice rather than to teach and command the things of God. That's end quote. Of course, this is of first importance, which is why it's number one off the list of Paul. Timothy. Watch what you say. When you're speaking, make sure it's always seasoned with salt. You're either challenging or encouraging from God's word. Make sure you're not wasting opportunity when you're speaking. Proverbs 10, 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. Proverbs 18, 13. Somebody that gives an answer before they hear everything out, it's to their folly and shame. I mean, we can just go on and on, can't we? What's the second thing? Well, the first two things are outward conduct, if you're taking notes. The the other three are inward uh, disposition. So the first two are outward conduct, speech and conversation or lifestyle. Your Bible might say behaviour or conduct. Well, speech and conduct go together, don't they? Your life should match up to your words. You know, I'm, I'm the pastor for saying, well, I preach it and my wife lives it. <laughs> that doesn't work with my wife. Um, don't suppose it'll work with yours either, fellas. So speech and conversation have to go together. Why? Because they're both observable. You hear one, you see the other. They go together. And conduct here means manners, manner of life. And this is not just uh, at church on a Sunday. This is at home, 
This is at the supermarket. Uh, this is this is right across the board. Uh, dads, this is when you're at the sporting event and your son's not put on the on the field and you think your son's going to be the game changer and you want to go up and coach and let them know exactly how to run that, coach that team. You need to be careful. Your life's being watched all the time. Be careful how you talk about the lady who's scanning your supermarket goods. Be careful how you talk to the telemarket who calls you and you don't want to buy the new mobile phone deal. It all matters. Speech and conduct and Yes, I'm speaking to myself here now as well. Let's go to the internal stuff. This shows you that even ministers have to work on their stuff. We all have to. Let's look at the internal stuff. The first one is charity. Well, love is the greatest of these, so obviously Paul starts at the top of the list. Agape. This is the love that you can't have without being a Christian because it's God-given love. It's Christ-like love. It's sacrificial love. Friends, the minister cannot be cold, cutting, and calculated as a professional. You get those ministerial types uh, that, that are so prim and proper and stoic that, that they just don't have time for anything. They're busy doing what they're doing. And they're a professional. Well, according to this, Timothy is to be sacrificially loving on his people as a faithful servant. Loving his calling, loving the church is called to shepherd. The people at Ephesus must see Timothy's love for them, his charity for them. How are they going to see that if they don't feel that from his own conduct and words himself? He's got to make that known. This would waylay any concern they had about his ability to do the job based on age or experience. The fact that Timothy was lacking in love and in chapter 1, verse 3, maybe willing to just walk out, is indicative of Paul's worst nightmare. Okay, I've worked on this guy. I believe he's called. He's got spiritual gifting. He's been laid hands on by the presbytery. He knows, and the church knows he's called to be there. But he's lacking in love by the look of it. And he's about to walk out. Friends, that's not what a minister does to a church. Oh, forget it. i get a better opportunity. Forget it. I'm out of here. No, this Timothy, you need to hang in there. All right? No matter how you're feeling. You're called to abide in this. Quite frankly, if he leaves, he proves himself a hireling. You're a gun for hire, man. You just go into the next church that's paying you the next greater wage or whatever that might look like. It's going to take a lot for a minister just to move on. A lot. Number four, faith. Now again, these are all things given to him by God. These are all going to be the things that he's gifted for that Paul reminds him of. You've got, a, you've got a gift of faith here. You've got faith to be here. So this faith is in relation to faith in God and the work he was called to do. What do we have when we have faith in God? We have a trust in God. A trust that God's got this in control. Don't look at myself. I have to trust that God's got me here. I have to trust that God's called me to this. It's the divine ability that God gives us to trust Him despite the results. <coughs> and you know as Christians, we're not accountable for the results as such. We're called to obey, we're called to do our best, but we leave God with the result. So Timothy is to faithfully do as he's commanded and leave God with the result. Preach, teach, command, and then have faith that God is working through His Word. Have faith that God's got you in the right place. He didn't make a mistake. He knows what he's doing. And stop second-guessing God by making your own decisions. Have faith in God rather than trust in your own panicky decision-making process of Timothy. Just because people think you're young or don't trust your leadership or they don't like the fact that you just kicked a couple of their favourite guys out of the church for teaching what they thought was an entertaining doctrine is beside the point. Finally, chastity, purity. Actually, I, I like the word chastity better. It's more accurate than purity. I think the idea behind the word is pure, but chastity is a better word. Why? Because it actually is linked to sexual purity. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, Paul will remind Timothy again that he's to keep himself pure. 
This is no accident. By the way, everyone, Timothy is a single man pastoring a church. Now, it's hard enough for any single man to stay pure. Amen? Men, fellas, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard enough, let alone for Timothy in the sacred role of a pastor to remain pure, which is again why I think Paul goes on and tells the church of Timothy, look, treat young women like sisters, not like your date. Treat women, elder women, like mothers. How would you treat your mother? You wouldn't be smooching your sister. So he's really trying to lean in on this and be careful. This is already because the false teachers have fallen for some of the silly young women in the life of the church and they've been kicked out for it. Timothy's to keep his mind and his heart and his actions pure, chaste. Let's go to verse 13. How is he to command and teach him to do these things? Well, he's to give attention to three things. He's just spoke about personal conduct. Now he's going to speak about his pastoral duties in verse 13. So let's go through these as we close out the sermon this morning. The word here for give attention to is proecho. It actually is a warning word. It means in other translations, beware. Beware that you don't pay attention to reading of the scripture, exhortation and doctrine. Jesus used this same word of give attention to when he said to the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware that you don't do things in front of other people to get a reward or get the attention. Beware of the um, false prophets. It's a word that when it's used, it's dangerous to ignore. So Timothy, be aware of these three things. The reading of the scripture, teaching of doctrine, and exhortation. So let's rattle this down here into what Timothy is now saying is his pastoral duties. Focus on the Word of God and encouraging with the Word of God. Timothy, if there's one job priority that's at the top of your list, it's knowing what's in God's Word by reading it. It's in teaching it and encouraging God. Timothy, if you fail in the top thing in your job description, you may as well just chuck away the rest of your job. Beware that you don't not do these things. Which is why, again, Timothy says, Paul says to Timothy later, you know, you must labor in the word and teaching and in doctrine, and therefore you're worthy of double honor for your church. Don't neglect these things. Don't ignore them. Literally, literally, Timothy, you are to be characterized by a threefold devotion and immersion into the biblical text. I mean, literally, any pastor should be oozing the Bible as they're teaching. They only have one thing to teach, and it should only be the Bible. Paul spells out, uh, Bill Mount says in his commentary to Timothy, the centrality of the text for theological correctness, which includes not just a basic reading, but reading the scripture in a way you can teach doctrine and encourage with that doctrine. This will only come, Mount says, to a complete and dedicated study, reflection, and devotion to God's Word. End quote. Some of the shoot that Paul is spelling out here in verse 13 a liturgy or a church order for what should happen in church. Now, although these elements of reading the scripture and exhortation and doctrine are critical in church liturgy, uh, Paul is rather telling Timothy here that these three things are critical if you're going to continue to defend our false teachers and keep the doctrine you teach pure. So that's why he's telling him. For a lot of other reasons, because the Word of God has benefit for all of life and godliness, but particularly to protect himself from doctrinal error, uh, Scripture is the only antidote. So let's have a look at the three before we uh, leave today. Number one, the public reading of Scripture. Well, this isn't new. Uh, it was already a part of Christian worship that had uh, transitioned from the Jewish synagogue. Uh, Jesus went and even Jesus stood up and read from the scroll, didn't he? He found the place in the scroll and read from it. Uh, you could even look at the modern Jews today standing at the wailing wall or in their worship. They'll stand there with their phylacteries on their head and they'll have 
a, a copy of their Torah, and what will they be doing? They'll be standing, reading, and kind of swaying to and fro. So this is where it comes from, uh, from the Jewish tradition. Uh, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 2, we see in the Old Testament that uh, standing from early morning to midday as Ezra read the law, uh, this is what the men and women of God would do. God's word would be read. When Josiah found it, he said, we need to read this thing to the whole of, of the community so we know what's going on. And when it was read, they repented and realized how far they had fallen from God's desired standards. This is one of the reasons why many congregations actually stand for the reading of God's word. And I personally don't have a problem with that. It's not like we're worshipping ink and paper. When God's word speaks, God's speaking. And so we need to revere the fact that God is addressing our lives and our hearts. This is why when we even design this place, there's going to be a wall between out there where the coffee is and in here where we're, God's word is read and taught and encouraged. Because when you walk in here to the sanctuary, you need to know that it's God speaking to you. And your mobile phone needs to be off. And your kids need to learn to sit there and revere the fact that God is speaking to their dad and to their mum and to them. And dads, if you're not sure, or mums, if you're not sure that they get it on the way home, you're working those things through with your family. So these things are critical in the life of that. I mean, sure, Timothy was told to privately read, absolutely. But then there was the public reading of Scripture too. Now, Deuteronomy, let's just turn there. We've got a second to quickly turn there. Deuteronomy 31. Just in case you're not quite convinced yet. Deuteronomy 31, 11 and 12. When all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God, here's the gathering of the saints again. We all appear before the Lord every Jew had to appear before the Lord at least three times every year with sacrifices. This whole notion of gathering as a church shouldn't be foreign to us. You didn't gather with God's people. The only people that didn't gather with God's people were the people that were excommunicated at him. A special privilege to gather with God's people. So he says there in verse 11, When all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose, you will what? Read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Make sure they hear it, all of them. Assemble the people. Watch this. Men, women, and children, as well as the aliens residing in your towns, so that they may what? Hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and to observe diligently all the words of this law. All of them. Not just Galatians and Ephesians. All of them. So all of the scriptures profitable. Who is gathered? Men, women, and children. And just stay with me here for a minute. There's no children's church in the Old Testament. Sure, if you've got a, you know, little ones and they need to be cared for, we understand that. But children, you sit with your parents in church, you learn to hear God's word, you learn to sit quietly and feel the weight of the command of Scripture hit your life and heart. The family sat together, they should pray together at the meal table, Dad, you should read the Scripture. You don't even have to do this dramatic sermon, just read a section out of the Bible every night before meal or during the meal. What do they say? A family that stays together, prays together? I mean, this is the whole notion behind family worship here. Paul also says, just moving on from this, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, some of your Bibles. So, well, this should teach us that there is a way to read Scripture and there's a way not to read Scripture. I think we should read it like it is the Word of God to us. Uh, it is God's voice to us. We should read it clearly, with correctness and appropriateness, with the tone of the passage, and give an emphasis to the right words and its location. JR got the reading this morning, and I thought you did a good job, brother. But when you're reading God's word, and we get our members to come up here uh, and, and read God's word, that it should be done with those things. It also means that when you're reading God's Word, you shouldn't be mumbling or stumbling over the passage. In a way that it cannot be heard or the meaning cannot be grasped. Reading in a linear or monotone voice so that 
as to indicate no emphasis in the passage to its key thoughts. Friends, one can do a great disservice to the reading of God's Word if it's not done properly. With the right volume, tone, diction, clarity, and pertinency of voice to the passage that's being read. So, reading, and I would even say some of the most fruitful times I've had with my own Bible reading is when I've gotten out in a car on my own and have just read the Word of God aloud. Just read it out loud and underlined it and read it out loud. It's like praying silently and praying out loud. When repenting of your sin out loud, it has more weight than it does when you just pray in your heart. So I think reading out loud, praying out loud really does make sense. Let's go to doctrine next. Timothy is told to give attention to doctrine. That is the teachings of the scripture. That's what doctrine means. The teaching. Now the Bible teaches lots of things. It teaches us about sin. It teaches us about Christ. It teaches us about how the law leads to the gospel. It teaches us about salvation. It teaches us about end times. It teaches us about all of these different things. And so Timothy, by reading God's Word, is to know the different teachings in the Bible. And thus be able to communicate them with authority, to command and teach them. He is to read all of Scripture and to be able to teach all of the teachings that are in Scripture. Which is why anybody that's esteeming to teach God's Word should have a systematic theology and something that breaks down the key teachings of Scripture. The key doctrines of Scripture. Paul had done this in Ephesus for three years at the Hall of Tyrannus. For three years he did a systematic doctrinal unpacking of all of the teachings that the Lord had revealed to him about Christ and the Gospel and the Church, about planting churches and all of these other things, about elders and faithful leadership, sacrificial love. Wouldn't it be great to have got a, a letter of the Hall of Tyrannus and see what he taught there, but we got what we got, and it's enough. Well, this is almost certainly linked to the call that Timothy has to teach and command because it's recognizing the doctrine. All the charges that Timothy gives, uh, Paul gives him to teach or preach the word. And really, this all sums up where he's going. Uh, Hughes and Chapel say in our modern day context sometimes. The text is so encrusted with stories and jokes that the actual original text is is unheard. They go on and say at other times, it is so distorted because it is preached through a therapeutic or political or social lens. The truth is, they say, without the centrality of the word and its exposition, there is no proper worship occurring in church. How do you know how to worship God if you don't know who God is? Brother, it was great to hear of God's eternality this morning. So that as we were singing to the Lord, we were singing to the eternal God. The God that never changes. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And finally, Timothy is called to exalt. He's called to read and study. He's called to know the doctrines and the teachings. And now he's called to encourage. So while doctrine is teaching, there also must be encouragement applied to it, mustn't there? That is, encouragement of how it is applied to your life. The application, the implications, how it applies to you as a person, personification. How does this doctrine apply to my life? How do I take all of these practical things? What does it look like for me to read God's Word and grow in it? To be loving to a brother or a sister? To grow in the teachings and doctrines of the Bible. Well, every great preacher and teacher has to cajole and convince their audience that the Word of God is not good enough to be taught alone, but it must be what taken and applied to our lives. This is what encouragement does. And guys, this is tough, but we're called to do it. God's commanding us here to do these things. And like Timothy, we need to take these things on board. What am I doing? I'm encouraging you. This is sometimes why we're always turning the table on you. Okay, this is what God's Word says. What about you? You know, I'm just challenged families. 
Do you pray? Do you read God's word together? Do you study God's word together? I guess this is encouragement. It's sort of like the bricks. Uh, is the mortar between the bricks. It's the motivation behind the message. Uh, remembering that a lot of people go, oh, I see this is great for the person sitting next to me. Well, although it is, it's actually good for you as well. And that encouragement needs to be taken on board so that we start taking it. And we preach it and teach it with enough authority that you say, well, I need to apply this. If this is God's word to me, if this is commanded to me, I don't have options. And last time I checked, a biblical command, there are no options. We obey as faithful servants. So in many ways, we should come to church prayed and prepared to hear and receive God's word, to be encouraged by it, even when it's tough teaching, so that we may ourselves take the encouragement and then we have the responsibility to apply it to our lives. So it's very important that as you're sitting there today, you're thinking to yourself, how do I apply this command to my life? If it's commanded to me and the pastor's encouraging me with it, what are those steps that I'm applying this into my life? Because the applications look different for every one of you. How foolish of me to think I would try and make application to one and then it would not apply to another. This morning, the areas of uh, speech and conduct may apply to some, but faith and purity to others. So I need to trust that as I'm preaching God's word, the Holy Spirit, who's helping me to teach, is convicting your very own soul, grabbing you and sh shaking you, so to speak, awakening you to the importance of living godly in Christ Jesus, and you're recognizing, I need to, wow, that's, that's, that's all important that these things hit me right between the eyes. I mean, really, what is the point of preaching if no one's actually taking what is being taught and learning from it and using it in their lives? Quite frankly, it's going to be my worst nightmare. Um, it's not true of biblical truth that knowing it alone is good enough. We must not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Understanding and applying it. So, as we close out this morning, we've looked at Timothy. Uh, pursuing godliness with all of his mind and overcoming his perceived inadequacies. Sure, we all feel inadequate. We all feel like we want to quit. We all feel like it's just getting way too much. I'm in way over my head, dear Lord, just living a Christian life. I can tell you how many times I've, I've talked with Virginia and other pastors saying, Look, I just don't know whether I'm cut out for this. This is what if the Lord wants me to leave, uh, I'm okay with that. I'm not trying to hold on to this position at all. Uh, and so we've got to overcome some of our own inadequacies. And secondly, he must base his ministry on God's word entirely. You only have one foundation to build upon, one thing to preach, one thing to live, one thing to read, one thing to study, one thing to teach from, one thing to encourage with. God's holy and errant and inspired word, Timothy. Let God's word do its work. You just preach it faithfully and leave God with the result. Let me close out with Spurgeon's warning to would-be ministers who would think themselves ready for the ministry, holy and prepared for the Lord. And he addresses their godliness here as Paul's addressed Timothy's godliness. He says, holiness in a minister is at once his chief necessity and his goodliest ornament. Mere moral excellence is not enough. There must be the higher virtue, a consistent character there must be. But this must be anointed with the sacred consecrating oil. All that which makes us most fragrant to God and man will be lacking. Old John Stoughton, in his treatise entitled The Preacher's Dignity and Duty, insists upon the minister's holiness in sentences that are full of weight, Spurgeon says. If user must die by touching the ark of God and to stay it, when it was to fall, if the men of Beth Shemesh for looking into it, if the very beasts that come near to the holy mountain be threatened, then what manner of persons ought they ought to be who admitted to talk with God familiarly and stand before him to be, as the angels do and behold his face continually, to bear up the ark on their shoulders, to bear his name before the Gentiles, in a word to be his ambassadors. Why, the voice of Jacob will do little if the hands be the hands of Esau, 
in the law, no person who had any blemish could offer sacrifices to the Lord. The Lord went there by teaching us what graces ought to be in his ministers. The priest was to have bells and pomegranates, the one for the sounding out of the bell of sound doctrine, the other the pomegranate of a fruitful life as they roamed the temple floor. Finally, when we say to you, my dear brethren, take care of your life, we mean be careful of even the minutia of your character. Avoid little debts, unpunctuality, gossiping, nicknaming, petty quarrels, and all the other of those little vices which fill the ointment with flies. Well, it's a sobering finish, but friends, what we're all called to do, to live godly in Christ. Let's look at that list. Let's take that to heart and uh, press into the Lord this day. Let's um, bow our heads in a word of prayer before we stand for the reading of the benediction. Lord God.